USIC leaders testify that the major cyber threat comes from Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Iran's APT-39 takes an interest in PII. A UAE surveillance program is revealed. Hackers scanning for unpatched Cisco routers. What Huawei faces in addition to fines. The FaceTime bug and responsible disclosure. Facebook was paying people to pwn their phones. Scam artists exploit a small disabled girl and the government shutdown's mixed effect on cybersecurity. It's time for a message from our sponsor, Recorded Future. You've heard of Recorded Future. They're the real-time threat intelligence company. Their patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web to give InfoSec analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. We subscribe to and read their Cyber Daily. They do some of the heavy lifting and collection and analysis that frees you to make the best informed decisions possible for your organization. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email and every day you'll receive the top results for trending technical indicators that are crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel and subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. It's timely, it's solid, and the price is right. It's recordedfuture.com slash intel, and we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, January 30th, 2019. U.S. intelligence community leaders yesterday testified before the Senate about the threat landscape. Cyber threats figured prominently, the Washington Post says. Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea were specifically singled out as aggressive and dangerous and as having significantly increased their cyber capabilities. Criminal or terrorist activity in cyberspace is a less serious problem, although the testimony did note growing systematic and opportunistic collaboration between nation-states and criminal groups. A new report by FireEye on Iran's APT-39 discerns a disturbing new interest of the Islamic Republic's hacking unit. It's going after personally identifiable information. This is said to be unusual for Iranian state-directed actors, who've hitherto concentrated on other objectives, like trade secrets, state secrets, and access to infrastructure. Reuters reports on a UAE program to intercept iPhone traffic and to engage in other forms of aggressive surveillance. The UAE security program, made possible by American civilians working under contract, became more ambitious and intrusive in 2016, after Emirati-owned Dark Matter assumed responsibility for security work previously performed by U.S. company CyberPoint. Some of the information collected indicated that Emirati intelligence services were targeting journalists, American citizens, and others who would have generally fallen outside the bounds of legitimate surveillance. The more recent activity described in the report seems to go beyond what's normally characterized as lawful intercept technology, and its scope appears to have been more extensive than had hitherto been thought. Last week, Cisco issued patches for its small business RV320 and RV325 dual gigabit WAN VPN routers. Attackers are currently scanning actively for unpatched routers, SC Magazine reports. Exploit code has been published and users should patch. Huawei's indictment in the U.S. could prove crippling, Wired says, if it results in loss of access to U.S. technology. That's the same stricture that brought ZTE to the brink last year. It remains to be seen whether the U.S. will proffer the same sort of lifeline. A FaceTime bug is now the subject of a lawsuit. Ars Technica reports that a Texas attorney is suing Apple because the bug allowed a deposition to be recorded. The plaintiff says he updated his phone to allow group FaceTime calls but not unsolicited eavesdropping. And, of course, that he suffered damages, which indeed he might have done. The listen-in before they pick up vulnerability was, as CNN and others note, discovered by a 14-year-old gamer and subsequently disclosed to Apple by his mom. Mom had trouble getting Apple to pay attention and busily woofed the news at them through every channel, apparently, she could think of, including faxes on law firm letterhead. 
The process by which the vulnerability was discovered and disclosed is interesting, especially in so far as it suggests that responsible disclosure might not be as simple as emailing a company and telling them what you've noticed. In this case, the bug was real, the disclosure both intelligent and responsible, but it need not always be so. Suppose you were contacted by the mother of a teenage gamer with the news that your product was an inadvertent piece of spyware. How seriously would you take the disclosure? And how often do companies get cranky disclosures? Crowdsourcing bug hunts has certainly proved itself in practice, but suppose every PewDiePie enthusiast, those spiritual descendants of the Howard Stern fan who called in to live coverage of O.J. Simpson's white Bronco slow-mo chase so he could riff on one of Mr. Stern's taglines, suppose we ask as a thought experiment that Mr. Pie's followers called in bug sightings with the persistence they devote to Tide Pod challenges. We don't know the answer here. Perhaps bug bounty specialists will weigh in with thoughts on quality control. Teenagers as a class are in the security news as well, with the revelation by TechCrunch that Facebook paid them, a lot of them apparently, $20 a month to let Facebook install an app on their phones that gave Facebook access to essentially all the information that transited their devices. And it wasn't just teens. The offer was open to users up to the age of 35 and had been in effect quietly since 2016. The software in question was the Facebook Research VPN. It's now gone from iPhones, removed by Facebook and blocked by Apple. For now, at least, it seems to remain available for Android devices. The data was attractive to Facebook for whatever insights it might offer into its users, to whom, of course, it feeds advertising. This is a bad look for Facebook, already in hot water over privacy, and looking for indulgence in the form of the hiring of the Electronic Freedom Foundation's council to come in and help them clean up data handling and privacy matters. Several governments are raising their eyebrows over the program, and Apple is none too happy either. The relationship between Facebook and Apple is likely to be strained in ways that will affect Facebook adversely. It's already revoked Facebook's enterprise certificates. There's tension at play, of course, between the privacy implications of online social media platforms and the legitimate benefits they provide for keeping in touch with friends and family and staying informed about goings-on in our communities. Mark Orlando is Chief Technology Officer for Raytheon Cyber Protection Solutions, and he worries about how easy it is to overshare online. Unfortunately, as individuals and consumers and personal internet users were sort of conditioned at this point to overshare about any number of things through all of the various social media channels that are out there, communities like Facebook and Twitter. But also increasingly, I think we've seen a lot of consumer services and and other sites that have social features and are using that social element and that sharing element to expand their business model and have their customers interact with each other. And and now I think also what we're seeing is there's increasing interconnectivity between those communities. So between Facebook, Twitter, and now Amazon, and, and like I said, some of these other you know e-commerce companies and, and, and apps adopting these social features and utilizing those communities to expand their you know, brand awareness, expand their customer base, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I think unfortunately, um, if you're doing anything over the internet these days, whether it's emailing or browsing or shopping or uh, selling goods and services yourself, you know, you're engaged in some sort of social activity. And I think the tendency, unfortunately, is to overshare uh, rather than, you know, try to control your information, try to be mindful of what's out there. So I think a lot of people do it without even realizing they're doing it. What kind of advice do you have for folks to be more mindful of it? I mean, I think, you know, a lot of what we enjoy about the Internet involves sharing things and connecting with friends and family and so forth. So I mean, how do you know what the right level is to dial in? Right. It's uh, it's really tough to know where that line is. And what I tell my friends and family is just, you know, assume that nothing is private. And while it's always good to kind of maintain awareness of, you know, what you're sharing and, and what the privacy settings are, you know, on your social media accounts and on your you know, e-commerce accounts and so forth. Um, you pretty much have to just assume that no matter what you set it to, uh, that information is not going to remain private, even if that means it's being shared between uh, different companies. And so, you know, really it's best to kind of err on the side of, you know, don't share anything that you wouldn't willingly post out in a public forum, even if it's with 
uh, a network that appears to you to be closed. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, years ago, someone saying uh, to me, you know, don't put anything in an email that you wouldn't put on a postcard. Right, exactly. And I, I think that still holds very much to be true. I think now we're kind of, uh, I wouldn't say fooled, but I, I think we're sort of led to believe that now that there are more granular and more obvious privacy controls um, with some of these sites and services, I think that kind of makes people think that it's it's really true privacy and that locking down their accounts or their profiles means that they're protecting their information. And I think that's true to a certain extent. But you know, as we've seen with some of the recent news stories, uh, the core breach and, and some of the other uh, kind of big breaches that have happened recently involving sites that use Facebook uh, and other sites for third-party authentication, you know, even if you have set your privacy settings to where you think no one's going to be able to view your information, it can still get out. As users and consumers, we're not always aware of the value that our data has. So even seemingly innocuous data like high-level details about yourself, location, you know, information that can be gleaned from your mobile devices, for example, or embedded devices, you know, we're not always aware of the value that information has. And unfortunately, that data, and especially that data in aggregate, uh, does have a lot of value to various kind of nefarious groups and parties you know, on the black market where, where that information is bought and sold. So even if you don't think that a certain piece of data that's collected from your profile or your device, for example, or your browsing history, uh, or your computer, for that matter, uh, even if you don't think that, that has a lot of value, uh, the fact remains that, that that data can still be a target and, and still does, in fact, hold value for a variety of different parties that you wouldn't necessarily want to have you know, access to that data. That's Mark Orlando from Raytheon Cyber Protection Solutions. Some scam artists set what may be a record for loathsomeness by swiping the story and pictures of a brave little girl with cerebral palsy to swindle sympathetic people into donating to a bogus charity in support of medical care she doesn't need. The family shared the story of the mighty Miss Maya, her nickname, and her progress toward her first independent steps on Facebook and Instagram, but for encouragement, inspiration, and joy, not for solicitation of donations. But grifters see a child's struggles as opportunity. Some hoods went so far as to threaten the family with further harassment and identity theft unless they paid $30,000 in protection. The criminals remain at large, but we hope they're caught, and when they are, may their names be forgotten. As for the mighty Miss Maya, we hope one day to see video of her dancing. And when you see a touching appeal online, donate with due diligence. Finally, what effect did the government shutdown have on cybersecurity? Virginia's Senator Warner has asked Homeland Security Secretary Nielsen for an accounting, and no doubt one will be forthcoming. But Security Scorecard has issued a preliminary assessment, and it's surprisingly mixed. Sure, there were all the expiring certificates, and to be sure, a full understanding of what went on will await more extensive study. But at least two important areas showed a distinct improvement. Patching and application of endpoint protections both rose noticeably, and those are good things. Why that happened is a matter of speculation, but the Washington Post's informed guess is as good as any we can think of. IT staffs were less distracted by urgent but unimportant requests from the people they answered to, and so could devote time and attention to patching and upgrades. So is this evidence that a lot of the GS-15s who stayed home were in fact non-essential personnel in some more than formal sense? Couldn't be. This isn't a Dilbert cartoon after all. At any rate... Bravo to the IT staffers who made hay while the sun shone. Now a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Observe It. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys. Your employees, contractors, and privileged users. In fact, a whopping 60% of online attacks today are carried out by insiders. Can you afford to ignore this real and growing threat? With ObserveIt, you don't have to. See, most security tools only analyze computer, network, or system data. But to stop insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. ObserveIt combats insider threats by enabling your security team to detect risky activity, investigate in minutes, effectively respond, and stop data loss. Want to see it in action for yourself? 
Try Observe It for free. No installation required. Go to observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observeit.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Observe It for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Craig Williams. He's the director of Talos Outreach at Cisco. Craig, it's great to have you back. Um, your team has been tracking uh, something that you're referring to as Pi uh, Part of that sounds familiar to me. What's going on here? Well, Pi is basically another family of ransomware trying to masquerade itself off as a Locky variant, right? Now, if you remember Locky, it was a, a piece of ransomware that was relatively popular, probably around 2017. Uh, and so, you know, it basically lost its market share when networks kind of went away. And so now there's a new attacker out there trying to kind of uh, cash in on that reputation, right? You've got to remember when it comes to ransomware, there's this fundamental problem of can I trust the attacker? Mm. And so what we've seen time and time again, even with things like as far back as Tesla Crypt, is the attacker will try to masquerade themselves as a relatively, and I'm using air quotes here for those of you who can't see it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trustworthy piece of malware, right? And so in order to solicit that ransom, there needs to be a reason for the victim to think they'll get their files back, right? No one's going to go through the trouble of turning currency into Bitcoin or whatever the ransom is and sending that across the internet without a reason to be paid. And so that's really, I think, why they're trying to piggyback on that Lockheed namesake. And how are they doing that? Are they are they successful or are people uh, falling for uh, the ruse? You know, I, I would assume so, right? It's relatively popular these days. And, you know, when we were looking at it, we immediately realized, hey, this is written in Python, right? There's a few differences here that are important to note. Hmm. Um, and so we were able to actually spot a few interesting things when we looked at it. One of the most interesting things actually allowed us to write a decryptor. And hmm. so, you know, as you know, Talos has its overall goal. Uh, for those of you with our T-shirts, you may notice on the back it says, pissing off the bad guys in all capital letters. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, in, in pursuit of that protection, we've decided to release our decryption tool free uh, on GitHub for the world to use. And so if you'd like, you can go to talosintelligence.com and pull down that tool. And as I said, it's open source, so people can extend it, people can modify it. Uh, but there is one caveat here. And unfortunately, it's a big one. Hmm. So the, the problem with this tool is that in order for the actual decryption to be successful, You've got to capture some of the traffic that comes out of the box when the malware executes. Hmm. So that really does shrink our effectiveness. However, you know, we do have a solution that may work for some people. And so I appreciate the opportunity to get out here and let people know that we have this tool. And so if you do happen to have traffic capturing going on in your network, even if it's a small window and you do have a PyLocky infection, well, we can help you out and you can hopefully resurrect the box. So any, any indications who's behind this particular variant? You know, not yet. Attribution is always an interesting critter, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've seen more and more, especially after Olympic Destroyer and some of the other more interesting samples where attribution based off of a software sample alone is a little bit hinky. Um, at Talos, we're really cautious. You know, you remember when we talked about Olympic Destroyer months and months ago, we pointed out how it had multiple false flags, how the attackers were intentionally including things to mislead researchers. And so unless we have pretty conclusive data uh, and other types of intel to, you know, increase that confidence, we're not going to go out and claim attribution because we're not 100 percent about it. We're very conservative with that in Talos, and we just want to make sure that when we do tell our users something that they can trust that it's the case. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. All right. Well, Craig Williams, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observeit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.